This conference will now be recorded. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Microsoft Excel 2. In this class, we'll be continuing our overview and discussion of the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet program. We'll be reviewing a lot of things we learned in Excel 1, and we'll add a few new things along the way. Okay, so in today's class, um, I'll be just going over the fundamentals of Excel again, and then we're going to open up Excel, get ourselves reacquainted with the screen, and then we'll perform a series of exercises to build a simple yet effective worksheet. Now, in this class, I will be using Excel 2019, which is one of the, one of the more recent versions of this program. As long as you have access to Excel 2007 or later, or a Microsoft 365 subscription, you'll find that whatever you learn in this class can be easily applied to those other versions. So in today's class, we're going to, as I mentioned, do a bit of review. We're gonna enter and work with data. We're gonna apply formulas to ranges of data and remember how those look, all right? I'm not gonna go over this in much detail right now. We will revisit this later, but just to kind of remind you of how um, a formula in Excel often looks in what we call the Excel syntax, okay? The way we're spelling that out. After we apply our formulas, we're going to format our data range, things like font type and size, uh, number formatting, okay? And other things along the way. We're also going to insert comments, which is something new, and we're going to skip them set up for printing. All right, if you remember from Excel 1, I told you that printing from Excel can be a little bit tricky. So I, we went over some good steps to take to ensure that your printed copy looks good. We're gonna take those same steps and also incorporate printing comments into that workflow. Okay, and that's a comment right there. We can leave comments on its specific cells on our worksheet for our review or for somebody else's review. Okay, or sometimes we do that to maybe clarify a data point or a data value if it needs a little further clarification. And we're also going to talk about freezing panes. This will come up, this will come later in class, but I will introduce freezing panes, which is a great way to enhance the view of your worksheet. So let's just review some of the basics here before we jump into the program. So when we are using Excel, we are building a spreadsheet, okay, or what we usually call a worksheet. It is a grid style spreadsheet made up of vertical columns identified by letter and horizontal rows identified by number. And where those columns and rows intersect is where we have our cell. So each little rectangle in that grid is called a cell, all right? And remember, whenever we identify a cell, we identify it by the column letter followed by the row number. So this would be the A1 cell. This would be A2, this would be B2, B3, C3, C4, et cetera. All right, so whenever we refer to a cell, that's how we refer to it. We don't, we tend not to refer to the cell by what's inside of it. All right, we always refer to the cell name, which would be, again, the column letter followed by the row number. Now, as we move around our mouse pointer, okay, around that worksheet, we will see several different cursors. And these are very important in Excel because they kind of tell you um, what you're about to do next when you click, essentially. So the one we're gonna see most often is the select cursor. This one here, the big white plus sign. And we see that when we are selecting a cell or a range of cells, which just means multiple cells. Okay, we group them in one selection. And we're often doing that to select a cell to work on it, enter a data value maybe. We're also doing that to format cells. Okay, we wanna change the color of the cells. Um, we want to incorporate those cells into a formula. All right, so whenever we need to select the cell itself, we're using the select cursor. The one underneath is a little black plus sign, and that's our fill handle. Remember, we only get the fill handle when we point at the bottom right uh, hand corner of our selection, whether it's one cell or a group of cells, a range of cells. So when we see that little box there in the bottom right hand corner where I'm circling, all right, when we point at that, we will get the fill handle, like you see the little black plus sign. And when we see that, we are able to copy formulas or data values into other cells. All right, so on its most basic level, it's able to copy and paste very quickly. 
it's more versatile than that. It does more than that. And we will review those things as we go through. All right, but just remember, the select cursor selects the cell itself. The fill handle grabs what's inside of the cell, what we would call the cell contents. Under that is the I-beam, one we've probably all seen before, okay? That just means when we see the I-beam, we are typically inside of the cell. We've selected the cell, now we're inside of it, all right? And we are inside the cell because we're either entering data or we are editing existing data. Last but not least, we have the two-headed arrow. There's a horizontal one and a vertical one. And we use these to resize columns and rows respectively. And we will see examples of this as we go through. Um, I would say you are you tend to resize columns more often than you do rows. Um, but again, you are able to resize row heights just like you can column widths left to right. Now, speaking of entering data into cells, we've selected a cell, now we're entering data. So what can we put in that cell? What kind of contents can be in that cell? So we can have text data, okay? Now, text data often pulls a double duty. It's often a data value in its own right, but it's also identifying other values, okay? Uh, but in some cases, text data is just a label. It's not really a unique data value. So let me give you an example of that. We have a vertical column made up of employee ID numbers. Okay. Well, those employee ID numbers, they may not make a lot of sense to somebody reading the spreadsheet unless in the top row above it, there is a text data value that says employee ID number. So in that case, that would be acting as a label identifying the cells underneath so we can make sense of them. All right, and again, I'll point out examples of this as we go through. Now, we can also, of course, enter number data or numerical data, and these are typically fixed specified values that we are entering ourselves. So if we're keeping track of how many we sold of each product in our store, we might just be entering that. I sold 35 of this, I sold 25 of this, et cetera. Now, once we enter all the data, okay, those hard data values, we can then incorporate them if we need to, into formulas, which are mathematical equations that are taking that data and performing some kind of calculation on them. So it might be adding up all the products we sold in our store today. That's just one example. And remember, we can incorporate text data into a formula as well, not just numerical data. So for example, if I need to count how many times someone's name appears in a worksheet, if it repeats, there's a formula that will do that for me. Okay, now, when we enter formulas, remember, we are entering cell references. We're referring to other cells to build that formula. So these next two bullet points are extremely important and I will elaborate in the next slide. So when we type an equation, we do not type in the data, we enter the cell reference where the data is stored. When we change the data in any cell, the equation will be updated automatically upon the change or entry of any data that is referenced in the equation. What does all that mean? Let's look here. Okay. So we have uh, an up close look at an Excel worksheet. We have columns D and E, and let's just say we have rows one, two, and three here. So this person, all right, They've entered a three into cell E1. They've entered a two into cell E2. And in cell E3, I can tell that they're entering a formula because of the equal sign. All right, every Excel formula begins with the equal sign. Now, when they construct that formula, they're not going to type in equals three plus two. They're going to type in equals E1 plus E2, like you see down here. So we're always using the cell names when we build our formulas. And we do that because the formula will automatically update the answer if the data in cells E1 and E2 change. Okay, here's rows one, two, and three again. All right, because remember, 
data often changes. We're, we're often updating it. What does not change, however, are the cell names, okay? Your column letters, your row numbers, those are constants. They cannot be changed. So whatever is in cell E1 and whatever is in cell E2 is going to dictate the formula and its resulting answer. So if I go to cell E1 and change this three to a six, okay, the answer shown in cell E3 is going to instantly and automatically update to an eight. So I can update my data values as often as I need to and those formulas and their answers will just update in accord, uh, accordingly. Okay, again, automatically, instantaneously. All right, so we'll look at this on a larger scale very quickly. On the left side, we have our initial data set. Okay, on the right side, we have our updated data set. We've made a change there. So let's look at the left first. First of all, let's look at how we've arranged this worksheet. In row one, what Excel would call the top row, we've set up labels or headers. All right, these are not really unique data values. Okay, they're more, they're acting solely as labels. They're identifying the values underneath so we can make sense of them. All right, which is important for kind of understanding the worksheet. Also very important for sorting and filtering, which we'll talk about in Excel 4 later this month. Now, it looks like we are, um, we're keeping track of how many CDs we sold in our store. We've arranged those CDs by genre in column A. And then we're tracking the quantity sold in column B, the cost per unit in column C, and then total cost in column D. So I can tell you that we have three formulas going on in this data set. In cell B6, there's a formula that is adding the values B2 through B5. Okay, and remember, this, the, the worksheet itself is not going to show you the formula after you've entered it, it's gonna show you the answer. The second formula is in cell, located in cell D2, which is multiplying the values in column B by the values in column C, left to right. All right, and in that case, that formula has been applied to these next three rows. Last but not least, we have a third and final formula in cell D6 here, which is adding up the values D2 through D5. Now, if we go over to the updated data set on the right, we've made a change. Cell B2 was originally 15, now it's 30 which means any formulas that reference that cell of B2, they're going to be updated and the answers they produce will be updated. So if you look at cells B6, D2, and D6, all the answers have been updated to reflect that change from 15 to 30. All right, so spreadsheets allow you to organize information in tables like we see here. Excel provides the added bonus of automatic mathematics, and Excel will keep track of the data you place in cells, and if you define cells to refer to each other, any changes made in one cell will be reflected in the referring cells as I just demonstrated in that example. All right, and just to remind you, on your keyboard, now oftentimes we are, remember that when you, um, when you insert a formula, excuse me, sometimes we let Excel do most of the work. Sometimes we can just build it ourselves manually. Okay, now it's, and actually today, we're gonna be doing some ourselves. So when you need some of your, when you need your basic mathematical operators, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, they're all, those symbols are located on your keyboard. Okay, if you're, if you're going to use the numerical keypad on the right of your keyboard, if you have one, that's of course totally fine. All those symbols are right there on that numerical keypad. Just make sure your number lock key is turned on. 
Otherwise, you could use the main part of the keyboard with the letters and the numbers. And those same symbols are also located on that part of the keyboard. I will let you know where they are when we get to that point. So let's put this away and jump into Excel. Now I'm using Windows 10 on my PC. I have an access point to Excel in my taskbar down below. Um, you can access, if, if you're accessing Excel right now with me, you can access it from whatever access point you typically use, doesn't matter, start menu, main desktop area or taskbar. So when we launch Excel, all right, just a reminder that the first screen we come to is the start screen. And you will see the same thing in the other big office programs, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Publisher. The start screen contains a template gallery. Templates are built in ready-made pre-designed specific types of a project. And they allow you to create that kind of project very quickly so you don't have to do it all from scratch. It's formatted, it's designed. You typically just erase the generic information that's there and plug in your own information, okay? So in this case, Excel gives us built-in templates for specific types of worksheets. So you can see some categories at the top there, business, personal, budgets, etc. And if you click on a template, oh, I'm sorry, if you, um, if you click on one of those categories, excuse me, you'll see more categories on the next screen here. So you, if, you, you know, if you ever want to explore these, by all means, you can see there are many. But for today's purposes, we're gonna be building a worksheet from scratch. So I'm gonna to go to the upper left-hand corner, click on the back button to come back to the screen. And remember that on the left side, we have that list of recent files. Again, you'll see this in all the Office applications. In this case, these are recent Excel workbooks that I've, um, these are Excel workbooks that I've recently created and saved. And there's Excel one practice from last week. So if I wanted to jump back into it, start working on it again, I could do that from here. So now what I'm gonna do is start a new workbook by going to the very first template, which says blank workbook. Give it one single click, and your screen should look like this. I'm gonna zoom in quite a bit here so you can see this better. All right, so let's just review um, some of the basics here in terms of working on um, entering data into the sheet, navigating through the sheet, and then uh, essentially the menu above, all right? And as I, if you took the Word 2 class with me this morning, this might sound familiar, this little spiel. Typically in the level two classes, I like to kind of go over all this again. All right, again, the work area and the menu. Then when we get to levels three, four, I tend to just kind of go over a few things very quickly and then just jump right in, okay? So um, so again, since this is Excel 2, I would like to just go over the screen again, like we did in Excel 1. So what we're looking at here is, of course, the main worksheet. We have a menu above. We'll come to that in a little bit. Let's look at the worksheet first. So this is where we're entering our data and building our data set, building our worksheet. We have the, the, we have the vertical columns identified by letter and the horizontal rows identified by number. Where the columns and rows intersect is where we have our cell. All right, so in this case, the active cell, we would call it A1. How do I know A1 is the active cell? Because of the nice green outline around it. Okay, also, the letter A and the number one to the left, they're shaded in to indicate that that particular cell is selected and active. All right, so we would call that the A1 cell. And just to go over this real quick, if I had a range of cells selected like this, all right, we would call this the A1 through D5 range. We start with the cell in the top left corner and end with the cell in the bottom right corner. So A1 through D5 range. If we were to type that into Excel, we would type it in with a colon, A1 colon D5. And you'll notice A, B, C, D are all shaded in, 
one through five are shaded in to indicate that that is the active range. Let me just select only A1 again. Now, when we enter data into a cell, it's very simple. As long as this cell is selected, we can just start typing. I'll do a couple very quick examples. You don't have to follow along with this part. We're, gonna, we're going to do more formal exercises in just a few minutes. All right, so I've just entered data into that cell. Now, when you want to move on to your next cell, okay, let's say I want to go down to cell A2. One way, one way I could do that is by clicking with my mouse using that select cursor, the big white plus sign. Remember, that selects a cell. So if I click on A2, now I'm on cell A2. And I'm just going to put in a random item number. And there we go. Now, let's say I want to go down to cell A3. So another way to select your next cell, instead of using the mouse, you could use your keyboard. The enter key will go down a column cell by cell. The tab key will go right across a row cell by cell. So if I press enter, as you can see, it goes down the column. If I use the tab key, it goes right across a row with each click. All right, I'm just entering some random data as an example. Now, if we need to go back to edit existing data, all right, um, as, I, as I instructed in Excel 1, we basically have two ways to do this. You can either overwrite the contents of the cell entirely, as if you're typing into the cell for the first time, or you can double click and edit it character by character. So if I want to change item number in cell A1 to item ID, I could select A1 and just type right over it. This would be overwriting the cell entirely. Okay, let me change it back real quick. Another option is to double click onto the cell, like so. There's the insertion point, there's my I beam that I'm waving around, and I can use my backspace or delete keys to change it character by character rather than the, the entirety of the cell. All right, so it's uh, depending on what you need to change, typically one of those options will be faster than the other. All right, and as I just showed before, when I selected that cell range, A1 through D5, all right, just remember, in order to do that, you just take your select cursor and you just click and drag, just like when you select or highlight text in a Word document. And as I mentioned earlier, we're often doing this to incorporate these, uh, maybe a cell into, or a, a number of cells into a formula, or to format them in some way. And we will do examples of all that as we go through. Now, underneath of the work area, oh, actually, before we do that, to the right of the worksheet, remember you have a vertical scroll bar to scroll up and down. All right, you could fit a lot of rows into one worksheet. And I do mean a lot. And in the bottom right corner here, we have a horizontal scroll bar to scroll left and right through the worksheet. And remember, after you get to column Z, you could still have more. The letters just start to double up, A, 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 B, A, C, eventually B, 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 C, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And as I advise in Excel 1, always a good idea to just make sure you're in the right place. As we enter data into a worksheet, we tend to start um, – the worksheet might just start scrolling on its own, okay? Or maybe you scroll by accident without even realizing it. So if I tell you to go to cell A1, instinctively, you're just gonna click on the top left corner, and there we are. But I'm actually on cell B4 because I scrolled down and to the right. So just every so often, just look at your sheet, make sure you're in the right place. And if you're not, just scroll accordingly to get back to where you need to be. Underneath of the work area, we have our sheet tabs right here. Okay, <clears throat> remember that in one Excel workbook file, we can have several separate worksheets. So as a default, you'll only start with one sheet. If I need to add another one, I go down, I click on the plus sign next to that tab, and now I have a sheet two. If I click it again, I get a sheet three, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a really great uh, tool in Excel because it allows you to um, 
keep related data sets together, but also separate at the same time. So for example, sometimes people will track, if I'm tracking monthly attendance, let's say, I can have each month can have its own worksheet. But the beauty is that they're all part of the same workbook file. So I don't have to access 12 different files to get to all the 12 months, just one file, 12 separate worksheets. Okay, now if you right click, which we don't usually right click in our Excel classes, but in this case, I'll show you if you right click on a sheet tab, you will get a set of options um, that kind of allow you to manage the entire sheet. So for example, I could delete a sheet. So I'm actually gonna delete sheet three right now. I'll right click on sheet two. I can rename it to something more specific. I can move it or copy it to another, um, either in this same workbook or to another file entirely. I could even password protect it. All right, there are some more options there, which I encourage you to explore at some point. But for now, um, I'm just gonna delete sheet two. So I only have sheet one left. Now let's go above the work, the work area and talk about the menu above. So remember when we use Office, Microsoft Office, 2007 or later, we are calling this menu the ribbon. And remember that the design of the ribbon is the same design you'll find in Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and Publisher. Of course, the tools are different, but the design is the same. So if you can learn one, you'll understand them all. Now, the ribbon is organized by a series of tabs. And, if, and I'll click on them right now so you can see what they are. Right now, the Home tab is currently selected. Next to the Home tab, we have the Insert tab, Page Layout, Formulas, Data, Review, View, and Help. So as you can see, when you click on a tab, you get a different set of tools for each tab. All right, and this Acrobat tab that you see online, just ignore that. That is uh, an extra feature that I have on my version of Excel. You likely don't have that on yours, so just pretend it's not there, okay? Also, if you're using a slightly older version of Excel, you may not have a help tab. Your help menu might be up here in the top right corner of the window by your window controls. All right, but otherwise, everything is pretty much the same. Now, I'm gonna go back and click on the Home tab again. Now each tab is further broken down by more specific categories. And those categories are listed at the bottom of that tab left to right. I'm underlining them right now. Okay, so uh, these categories are called groups. So for example, in the home tab, I have a clipboard group, a font group, alignment group, number, styles, cells, and editing. So those groups are there to help you locate the tool you need in that tab. Also remember that in many of these groups, all right, we're, we're, we're kind of working from general to specific, right? In many of these groups, there is an access point to, in most cases, mo more tools than what you see in the ribbon. So when you see this little diagonal arrow in the bottom right-hand corner of a group, that's called the dialog box launcher. And I will use the number group as a quick example. When I click on that, it will launch a dialog box like we see here. All right, now these dialog boxes, they often repeat the same tools that are in that group in the ribbon. But instead of using icons, it kind of lays them out in a plain text format. All right, so sometimes these are a bit easier to use if you're having trouble locating a tool, okay? In fact, the number group is one that I use. Um, I use the dialog box for the number group all the time. I just find it easier myself. Also, these dialog boxes often contain extra tools that are not in the ribbon. So sometimes we prefer to use these and sometimes we have to use these. At the moment, however, I don't need this at all. So I'll go to the bottom right-hand corner and click on cancel. All right, a couple more things. In the top left corner, all the way up there, you have what's called the Quick Access Toolbar. You'll find this in the other Office programs as well. In the Quick Access Toolbar, you can add 
additional access points to your favorite tools so you can get to them faster. It's also a great idea or alternative um, that you could use if you're having trouble remembering where certain tools are located. All right, Excel can be one of the harder ones to kind of memorize the layout of all the tools in terms of Office programs. So if, if you just can never seem to remember where this one tool is, just add it to your quick access toolbar and then it's always there. So to do that, go to the right of the quick access toolbar, click on the little icon, uh, the triangle with the line over it, that's the icon for more options. It will give you a preliminary list of some tools that you can add. But if you want to get to all the tools in the ribbon, go down and click on more commands. And from this dialog box, you can add whatever tools you need. You just have to add them one at a time. So you select the tab in which that tool is found. Select the specific tool from this list. Click add in the middle. And then repeat that process for each additional tool. Once you've added all the tools you need, go to the bottom right and click OK, and then they will be available in your quick access toolbar. Last but not least, underneath the ribbon, now this is unique to Excel, we have the formula bar. Okay. The formula bar displays the contents of a cell that is selected, which is especially important for formulas, hence the name formula bar. Because remember, if I insert a formula into a cell, once I enter that formula, the cell itself is going to show me the answer. So if I forget what the formula is going on behind the scenes, or I just want to verify whether there's a formula there at all, I can select that cell and look in the formula bar, and that's where it will show me. All right, so I'm going to just go back to square one here. Let me just delete. Oh, and I always, for some reason, I always forget to mention this. If you ever need to delete the contents of a cell, uh, the fastest way is just to select that cell and press delete on your keyboard. Okay. You can also select multiple cells and delete all the contents in one shot, like so. All right, so let's get started building our worksheet here. So kind of like the example we saw in the initial lecture, we're doing something similar. We're going to pretend that we work in a music store and we are keeping track of what we sold for our Broadway musical soundtracks. Okay, Broadway musical soundtracks. Each of these soundtracks was part of a monthly promotion. So in January, one title was promoted. In February, another title was promoted, et cetera. So we want to keep track of all that data. And then we're going to also include some formulas to calculate more data for us. So the first thing we want to do, let's enter the titles of our soundtracks in column A. So we're going to be working. There's going to be a total of 12 titles. So we're going to be filling in the range A1 through A12. All right, now um, I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to enter these titles, okay, and I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll wait a little bit after just to let you, if, if you're doing this with me, so you can catch up real quick, okay. Now, at certain points, you're going to, as you're typing in the data, it's going to be, it's going to look like it's too much to fit into the column. Don't worry, just keep working, and then we'll fix, we'll fix that after the, after that point. All right, so let's go ahead and enter some titles here. All right, the first one's going to be Chicago. I'm going to press enter to go down to cell A2. If you want to click with your select cursor, that's fine as well. All right, the next one is the music man. Now this one's way too big for the column, that's okay. Just move on to A3 and we'll fix it later. Next, we have In the Heights, again, too big, that's okay. Now we're on cell A4, where we have Newsies. Cell A5, we have Avenue Q. Cell A6, we have Funny Girl. 
Cell A7, cats. Cell A8, hairspray. Now, when I go down to cell A9, it's going to start to scroll. So some of the cells up top are going to be out of your view. Uh, cell A9, we'll do West Side Story. A10, Hamilton. A11, Moulin Rouge. Okay, the spelling for that one is M-O-U-L-I-N space R-O-U-G-E. And cell A12, which one am I missing here? Oh, Wicked, Wicked, there we go. All right, so I'll zoom out for a second in case you need to see the whole list. All right, and then in about a minute, we're gonna continue moving. All right, so I'm gonna zoom back in. All right, and here we are. So, now we have our data range. Oh, you know what, I, sh I meant to stay in cell A12. I wanted to remind you like I did in Excel one last week. Okay, when you enter your last data value, all right, we tend to kind of, um, at least in these classes, we fill in things by Specific ranges, right? We went down to A12. Now we're taking a quick pause until we move on to our next data range. All right. When you enter your last value for that range, all right, it's um, it's a good idea to exit that last cell completely. So if you're if you look at A12 and you see that blinking insertion point, that means you're still inside the cell. I would advise you to just click onto any other cell press enter, whatever you need to do, all right, to leave, to exit that cell. And I say that because of a couple reasons. If you're inside of a cell, a lot of things don't work. Resizing columns and rows, zooming in or out. A lot of the tools in the ribbon, if you look, they are grayed out, I can't use them, okay? Another reason I advise you to do that is because if you forget, when you move on to your next thing, you might just forget that you're in there and you start typing and before you know it, you're messing up a data value. All right, not a huge deal because we can always undo using our undo tool in the quick access toolbar. All right, but just to kind of save you the hassle, always a good idea to just exit that cell completely and then you're quote unquote, you know, you're a done for now. All right, I would, so just exit that cell. All right, so we have our data range complete for now. I'm gonna scroll back up. Now, we have a lot of data values that are way too wide for the column. As you can see in Excel, the columns and rows, they won't um, expand or in some cases maybe contract to, um, they won't do that automatically. Okay, we have to do that ourselves. So there are a few ways to resize columns and rows. Um, the way I like to show people is to use the auto fit tool because it will make it just the right size. And it's just the fastest way to do it. So again, make sure you're, not inside of a cell, otherwise this will not work. So if I bring my mouse pointer up between the column letters, in this case, A and B, you will see that it turns into a two-way arrow going left and right. Okay, and that's a resize cursor. 
Now, whatever I do, it's going to impact the column to the left. Okay. And that's like a recurring theme with Excel. When we, for example, when we insert new columns, they go to the left. If we resize a column, typically it's going to be the one on the left. So it's always columns left, rows above. That's just kind of how Excel does things. All right, so whatever I do now is going to impact column A to the left. So what I'm going to do is between A and B, I'm going to double click. And that's going to just resize column A to just the right dimensions. It's not too wide where it's taking up unnecessary space. It's not too narrow where it's cutting off my data. And that's why they call it auto fit because it's just looking for your longest data value in that range and, and sizing itself accordingly. All right, now you with that two-way arrow, you can also click and drag to make it whatever size you want, as you can see. But I'm just undoing it because uh, that can be an issue, especially if you want to print. We usually try to conserve space in Excel. So in this case, we're just going to use the auto fit. All right, and, and the same thing applies to rows. If you need to resize the height of a row, which doesn't happen often, but there are instances where we need to do that, you would go between the numbers and whatever, um, whatever you do here will impact the row above that two-way arrow. All right, so the next thing I wanna do, we're still working on the same data range and then we're gonna save our work. Um, we did this in Excel one, typically when we organize text data in a spreadsheet in real life, we typically arrange it or sort it alphabetically A to Z. All right, when we're inventorying or cataloging, all right, we tend to do things A to Z so that we can pinpoint specific values if we need to. We know the A's are at the top, Z's are at the bottom, et cetera. So let's go ahead and sort this data range. It's very simple. In your home tab, so we're going up to the ribbon now in the home tab, over to the very right in the editing group, you have your sort and filter tool. Now, I would again advise you, don't, um, don't select multiple cells in that range. You don't even have to select the whole range, okay? In my opinion, it's the safest bet to just select one cell and one cell only. All right, and we'll see why it's, um, in Excel 4, we're gonna talk about sorting and filtering more extensively, okay? But typically it's safer to sort uh, by just selecting one cell in the range that you want to sort. So I've selected A1. Now I'm gonna go up to the sort and filter tool and click on it. And I'm just gonna go with the very first option, sort A to Z. And now everything's sorted alphabetically. All right, however, it is, but it's not. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a human error in here, a data entry problem. In cell A10, where we have the music man, in the real world, we tend not to alphabetize by articles like the, or uh, all right, if we were looking at this in our music store, it would probably be found under music man, comma, space, the. We usually um, add the article to the end of the proper noun. Again, Excel is not gonna pick up on this. I need to fix this myself. So I'm gonna change this to music man, comma, space, the. So I'm gonna double click into the cell, use my backspace key to erase the, move my insertion point to the end, add a comma, space, and put the here. And then I'm just gonna leave the cell, but it's still not alphabetized correctly, so I need to sort again. So I need to select one cell in that range, which I've just done, cell A11. I go up to sort and filter, I click on it, and I select sort A to Z again, and now it's sorted properly. Okay, and another reminder, real quick, if you end up with something like this, which I've seen many times, 
Let me zoom out for a second. All right, A2 through A12 are sorted correctly, but A1, I have wicked. Why is that one out of place? It's because there's a space be before the first character in that value. So in this case, there's a space before the W. All right, if you put a space or more than one space, okay, however many spaces, Excel is going to sort that at either end, depending on how you sort. It puts those to the top or the bottom. So if you run into that problem, it is because you have a space. So just go into the cell, backspace over that space, exit the cell, and then sort again. Now, after all that hard work, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. So I'm gonna to go to my file menu and go to save as. I'm gonna select this PC because I wanna save it on my computer, not my OneDrive account. And I'll click browse to browse the folders in my PC and select an appropriate folder. Remember that when you're using Microsoft Office, uh, typically um, it will, if you're using it in Windows, it, excuse me, it will automatically dump you into your Windows Documents folder. You can put, the, you can save this wherever you want. That's it's just assuming that that's where you want to put it. But in my Documents folder, I have a subfolder that I created called Class Samples. So I'm going to put it in there. So it's a little more specific. So I'm going to double click on Class Samples, open it up. Now I'm inside of that folder. Notice the file path. Class Samples, that's what I'm looking inside of. And I'll go down to File Name. Right now it's called Book 1, which is way too generic. So I'm going to erase that and I'm going to call this Excel 2 Practice. And then I'll click Save to save this workbook. Now remember, any um, from that, from here on out, every other time we save, all we have to do is either click on the Save Disk in our Quick Access Toolbar, or go to File and click Save. That's just gonna be a quick save to update the workbook. Okay, now, um, each of these titles was also part of a monthly promotion. Okay. And just to keep things simple, it just so happens that these are alphabetized, but they're also in the order in which they were promoted. Meaning, Avenue Q was part of the January promotion. Cats was part of the February promotion. Chicago, March, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna enter that data, okay, those, those uh, promotional months. But, I want to put it to the left of this column, okay? Of course, the issue is that we've already used up the first column in the sheet, which is column A. So how can I, how can I do that? Well, remember, we can insert new columns and rows whenever we need to, even if it's your new first row or your new top, uh, your new first column or your new top row. So kind of like we saw with resizing before, okay? Whatever we do is going to happen to the left. With meaning, if I need to insert a new column to the left of column A, I need to select any cell from the current column A. Because that's going to be Excel's way of targeting where the new column is going to go, which will be to the left of this. So I've selected cell A3. Again, just any one cell is fine. Now we'll go up to the Home tab over to the cells group and go to the insert dropdown, not the icon. That's only gonna give you one cell. We want an entire sheet column. So go to the insert dropdown and select insert sheet columns. And as you can see, all the contents from column A have been shifted over to column B and now we have a new column A. Now I'm on cell A1. So I'm gonna start with the first month, which was January. I'm, make sure you spell it correctly. J-A-N-U-A-R-Y. And then exit the cell and stop there for one second. Don't enter any more months. Now, in Excel 1, we talked about auto-filling a series. 
okay? Auto filling a series. So remember one uh, cursor we have not used yet is the fill handle. We've used all the others we talked about before, select cursor, resize cursor, I-beam. We have still not used the fill handle, so let's review the fill handle. On its most basic level, the fill handle copies and pastes values into other cells. So if I go to cell B4 where it says funny girl, and I go to the bottom right hand corner and point at the little box, I'll get the fill handle, there's the black plus sign. If I now click and drag to the right, it's just gonna copy and paste that value into the next cell that I've selected. Let me undo. Zoom in a little bit here, okay. Another thing the fill handle does is it will auto fill a series. So depending on the cell you select as your starting cell essentially, it will detect a series and fill in the blanks for you. So in Excel one, we did consecutive numbers. Here, we can auto fill the months of the year. So select cell A1, which says January, go to the bottom right hand corner, point at the little box and get your fill handle. Again, it's that black plus sign. Click and drag down to cell A12, let go, and you'll have all the months of the year filled in. As you can see, all right, I'm just zooming out for one second. Now, once again, uh, some of these values are too wide for the column, so we need to resize column A. September, November, December, okay, they're all too wide. So make sure you just, make sure you're not inside of a cell. Go between A and B, get your double, or your two-headed arrow, and double click. And now column A has been resized using the auto fit method. Okay, we should probably do a quick save to update our, our workbook. So I'll just go up to the quick access toolbar and click on, the, click on the little disk there. Remember, you can also go to file and click on save. Okay, now uh, one thing, and I did this on purpose, one thing we forgot to do, let's say, we should have put in our column labels first probably. So the months are pretty self-explanatory, although they're not just months, they're promotional months. So we wanna be a little specific about what those are. Column B, we have Broadway musicals, but we might sell these on CD, record, uh, DVDs. We might have sheet music in our store. So we need to be specific about what we're tracking here. So we need to put column labels in row one, which will identify the values underneath. Once again, we have a similar issue we had before. We've already taken up our top row, row one. So it's okay, all we have to do is insert a new sheet row. So remember columns went to the left, rows will go above. So if I select any cell in the current row one, doesn't matter which one it is, when I insert a new row, it's gonna go above this. So I've selected cell C1, I'll go up to the home tab, I'll go over to the cells group again, go to the insert drop down and select insert sheet rows. And now I have a new row one and everything was shifted down. All the contents were shifted down from rows to rows two through 13. So now I'm gonna to go to cell A1. All right, just to be a little more specific, rather than saying month, I'll say promo month. Now this is a little tricky. This value is obviously too wide for the cell. I wanna to go to cell B1, because I, I have to exit the cell first before I can resize column A. But in this case, I won't be able to click on B1. It's just a kind of a unique thing with rows when you're going left to right. So just press your tab key to force it over to B1. In this case, you definitely wanna use your keyboard option to go to B1 like this. And then I'll go back, uh, I'll go up between A and B with my two headed arrow and double click. There we go. Now I'm gonna go to cell B1. 
and we're going to put in CD title. So now we know we're talking about CDs. All right, now we're going to fill in the remainder of our labels since we're up here in row one. We're going to be working from C1 over to G1. And then we're going to fill in some more data and then we're going to get to formulas. So I'm going to go over to C1. And this one's going to be called quantity. Now I'm going to go over to D1 where we have cost per CD. Again, it's too wide for the column, so I'll use the tab key to make my way to E1. And now that I've exited that cell, I can go up between D and E and double click with my resize cursor. Perfect. Now in cell E1, I'll put in subtotal. All right, I'll go over to F1, where we have sales tax. And then I'll go to G1, where we have grand total. Okay, once again, the contents are too wide for the column. So I'll press, in this case, you can really go anywhere since we're not, since we're done with um, this row right now. So just click anywhere outside of it, it doesn't matter. And then go between F and G and double click with your two headed arrow or your resize cursor. Oh, I'm sorry, between between G and H, excuse me. I didn't mean to confuse you there. There we go. All right, now we're gonna go over to cell C2 under quantity. All right, columns C and D, we're gonna fill these in ourselves manually. It's just going to be manual data entry, and then the rest will be filled in through the use of formulas. All right, so cell C2 here, we're looking at, and by the way, earlier, if you remember from the initial lecture, I said that text data often pulls a double duty. It's both a label and a unique data value. Here's an example of that Avenue Q. Okay, it is making, it's a label basically for column C and really all the other columns. Okay, but it's also a unique data value in, an, in its own right. I just wanted to point that out. So we're on cell C2. We're gonna enter the quantity sold for each of these titles. We'll work down the column and then we'll move over to column D. So I'm gonna just, oops, I have my wrong sheet here, excuse me. There we go. So I'm just going to essentially shout out these numbers. All right, I'm going to do three at a time. And then we'll move, we'll move over to column D. So I'm on cell C2. I'm going to put in 11. I'll go, I'll press enter. 12, enter, zero. All right, I'm on cell C5. 13, 9, 22. So 13, 9, 22. Scrolling down a little bit. I'm on cell C8. 24, 6, 11. 24, 6, 11. All right, now I'm gonna be scrolling down. So uh, the first couple data values will not be in your view, but I'll scroll back up and show you the whole thing in a second. All right, uh, in fact, let me scroll down a little bit more here. Good, cell C11, starting here, the, remain, the remaining three are 13, 19, 15. So 13, 19, 15. 
groups. And if I zoom out a little bit, you'll be able to see the whole range. Okay, now I'm going over, I'm going up to cell D2. I'm going to zoom in again. All right. So starting with D2, now we have cost per CD. So these are going to be uh, currency values. All right, they're all going to be something 99, something dot 99. And in this case, I'll do two at a time. So we have 999, 899. Then we have 1499, 999. All right, next up, I'm on cell D6. 1199, 1099. I'm on cell C8, 1099, 899. Now it's going to start to scroll down a little bit. So let me just actually just finish that. I'm on cell D10. Nine ninety nine, eleven ninety nine, and now I'm on cell D twelve. The last two here, we have ten ninety nine, nine ninety nine. And I'll zoom out for a second so you can see the whole thing. All right, now let's move on to column E. I'm going to zoom back in. We're going over to column E where we have a label called subtotal. We should do a quick save to update our workbook. I'll do that right now. Okay, so now we have a subtotal. So this is going to be a calculation. We're going to be referring to specific cells to run this formula and give us the answer. So we have a subtotal. That's going to be a combination of some combination of the quantity and the cost per CD to give us a subtotal. All right, in dollar a dollar amount of how of what we sold. Okay, so what mathematical operation are we using here? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We're going to be multiplying, right? We're going to be multiplying the values in column C by the values in column D, which will give us a subtotal. Now in this case, all right, this is a pretty straightforward calculation and we're only referencing two cells. So we can get away with just doing this one manually, but I will review how to use an Excel function as well. All right, we will, um, we will get there. But for now, go to cell E2 and let's just do it manually. We're going to press the equal sign key first. That's the first thing we always need for formulas. So up by your backspace key, you'll see the equal sign key. Click on it. The first cell we're, we are referencing is cell C2. You can either click on C2 or type in C2. Now we need the multiplication symbol. 
If you're not using the, the numerical keypad on the right, if you're going to use the numbers at the top of the keyboard, it's going to be Shift 8 for the asterisk. That's the multiplication symbol on a keyboard. Then we need our next cell, which is D2. So I'll just type it in. So it should say equals C2 multiplied by D2. Now I'll press enter to apply and run the formula. And there's my answer, 109.89. All right, so a couple things here. Remember, if I click on cell E2, what's really in that cell is not 10989. What's really in that cell is a formula producing the answer of 10989. All right, and how do I remember that? Because if I select that cell and look in the formula bar, it will tell me right there equals C2 times D2. All right, and the other big takeaway, remember, the beauty of using the cell names rather than the actual data values is that if I have to update my data, if I have to go to cell C2, for example, and change it from 11 to, to 30, let's say, the answer in cell E2 will update instantly and automatically, as you can see. But let me undo it to go back to the way it was. I'll go up to my quick access toolbar and click on the left turning arrow, which is the undo tool. Now, let's return to column E. I want to take that formula, equals C2 times D2, and apply it to all the other rows. So what I want is equals C3 times D3, equals C4 times D4, et cetera, et cetera. I do not have to go into each cell and insert that myself. Once again, we could, we could use the fill handle to copy the formula and paste it and apply it to the other uh, cells in this column. So I've selected cell E2. Here's that fill handle again. I'll go to the bottom right-hand corner, point at the little box, get that black plus sign. There it is. That's my fill handle. And now I'll click and drag down to cell E13. And I'll let go. Now I have all of my subtotals. All right, so Excel knows what it's doing. So this 10788, that's equals C3 times D3. The zero, that's equals C4 times D4, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and uh, a little trick real quick. Let me undo it. You don't have to undo yours if you don't want to. I'll just show you on my end. If you are, a, if you are copying and pasting a formula down a column rather than across a row, if you're going down a column, you can also, rather than click and drag, you can get your fill handle and double click. And that will do the same thing. And it will just end where your data range ends. Now let's move over to column F for sales tax. Okay. So now we have our sales tax. Now a sales tax, is a flat, as you probably know, it's a flat percentage um, of the subtotal. That's how we calculate a sales tax. It's a fixed or flat percentage of the subtotal. Now, whenever we use the word of in a mathematical calculation, we're talking about multiplication again. So in other words, um, let's say our sales tax is 7%. Our formula is going to be 7% multiplied by the values, the values in column E here. So in cell F2, I'll set up the formula. I'll press the equal sign. All right, I'll put in the sales tax first. Now, in this case, we're not using two cell references. We're actually using a fixed number and then a cell, which is, which is of course, fine. Okay, Excel can do that. So I'll type in 7%. You don't have to convert it to a decimal. You could just put in seven. The percentage symbol is shift five. Equals seven percent multiplied by, so I'll shift eight again for the asterisk. And then cell E2. So I'll just type it in. Seven percent of cell E2. 
I'll press enter to run the formula. And there it is, $7.69. All right, and we are dealing with currency. And don't worry, in a little bit, we're going to format our currency values so that they're only two decimal places. No more than two decimal places, but we'll get to that in a little bit. All right, now, once again, I don't need to re-enter that formula for each and every other row in the data set. I can just copy and paste it and apply it down the line. So I go to cell F2, I select it, because that's where the formula is located. I go to the bottom right corner, I get the fill handle, and remember you can either click and drag down to cell F13, or you can just double click. Now we have the sales tax values F2 through F13. Last but not least, column G. Let's go to cell G2. All right. <clears throat> we have a grand total now that we want. So the grand total is going to be a combination of the subtotal and the sales tax. So in this case, what, math, what mathematical operation are we doing? This time we're just adding. We're gonna add the subtotal to the sales tax to give us a grand total. Again, we're only dealing with two cell references here. It's pretty straightforward, so we don't need to use the sum function necessarily like we did in um, Excel one, okay? But uh, just to review, how we do it with a function, let's use the function name here, okay? So in this case, instead of entering the formula myself with the keyboard, I'm gonna let Excel do most of the work. Let's review functions very quickly. In your home tab, over to the very right in the editing group, you have the auto sum tool, okay? That is just one function. In, the, in, that, in that case, that's the sum function, S-U-M. If you click on the dropdown, you will see a few other names here. These are all different functions, average, count numbers, max, and min. If you click on more functions, it will open a dialog box, which displays, uh, a dialog box that displays all the functions in Excel's function library. So everything Excel can do and they're all categorized using this dropdown. Okay, so Excel functions, they kind of range from very basic to very complex. And you can combine functions into more into one um, Excel formula. All right, which is obviously takes a little more experience, but you can do that. Now I'm gonna click cancel for a second. You can also find that function library if you go to the formulas tab in your ribbon and just underneath is the function library group. And you'll see all those same categories with all the different functions. All right, so all of these little names you see, they are, those are the functions and essentially the, calc, the mathematical calculation is built into that name. So that means that all we have to do ourselves is tell Excel what cells in the sheet to incorporate into that function and then Excel will do the rest, okay? So um, you can generally do this in either order. You can select the cells first and then select the function, or you can select the function and then select the cells. In this case, let's select the cells first. So I'm gonna go, again, we're adding the values in column E by the values in column F. So I'm gonna use my select cursor. Remember, we're not using the fill handle this time the normal select cursor, the white plus sign. I'm gonna select E2 and F2, like this. So now I'm telling Excel, I wanna incorporate these two values into a function. Now I need to select the function. So I'll just go back to the home tab, over to the right in the editing group, I'll click right on auto sum because that's the one we need. And if you look in cell G2, there it is. Now let's just review how the function looks. I'm gonna double click on G2 so you can see it better. If you're going to do this, be very careful because you're gonna be inside the cell. 
So there is the function. So when we use functions, this is how they're always set up. Equal sign first, followed by the function name. When we use functions, the cell range must be enclosed in parentheses. So that's why you see the parentheses there. Okay, and in this case, the colon indicates a range. We don't need a plus sign because the plus sign is built into the sum function. All we need, to, like I said, all we need to do is indicate the range. So now if, if you're inside the cell like this, I would advise you not to click, just press enter. All right, I'm gonna do a quick save. Now I want to apply that formula to the other rows. So once again, I select cell G2. I go to the bottom right hand corner, I get the fill handle. Little black plus sign, I double click. And there we go. It's applied the same formula from cells G3 down to G13. And by the way, if you're curious about the multiplication we did, if you wanted to use a function for that instead, like this one here, C2 times D2, it would be product. Okay, whenever you multiply numbers together, the answer is called the product, hence the, the function name product. So that would look like this, equals product, parenthesis, C2 colon D2, closing parenthesis, and there's the same thing. All right, now if you wanna do it one more time, now I want a total of all sales. So this time I definitely wanna use a function and I'll tell you why in a second. I'm zooming out a little bit here. So I want a total of all sales, which means I'm gonna be adding up all of the grand total values, okay? So since I'm working top, uh, top down here, it makes sense to just put the formula maybe right underneath in cell G14. Now remember, you can put formulas wherever you want. It doesn't, have to, it does not have to be directly adjacent to your data set. You can put it way out in no man's land because all that matters is um, are the cells you're referring to in the sheet. But because, of course, I want you to see this on one screen and because we might, we might want to print our work, let's make sure everything's nice and close together. So in cell G14, we're gonna, we're gonna um, enter our formula, but before we do that, I should probably create a label that identifies what this is going to be. So I'm gonna create a label called total sales. In this case, it will be a row label. It's gonna identify something to the right of it. So I could put this in cell A14 over here under December, but that's kind of a long span. So I'm actually just gonna put it in cell F14 right next door. So in cell F14, I'll type in total sales. All right, I can tell that this value is a bit too wide for the column. I can tell because there's no green line on the right side. So I'll exit the cell. I'll bring my mouse pointer up between F and G and double click. Perfect. Now I'm gonna go down to cell G14. And actually, I'm gonna select the cell range first. So I'll go to cell G2. Sorry for the, sorry that I, um, I misspoke. I'm gonna go to cell G2. And remember, we're not using the fill handle. We're not copying and pasting anything. We're just selecting the cell. So I'm gonna select G2 through G13. All right, and it's gonna put the formula and the answer right underneath automatically. So now I go back up to the home tab over to the editing group and click right on auto sum. Press enter, oops, hang on one second. Why is it grabbing this row? Let's find out. Should not be grabbing that row. Mm -hmm. All right, for some reason it thinks I'm working across the row, which it usually doesn't have that problem. Let me see here. Oh, somehow I messed up. All right, I'm not sure how that happened. 
I must have clicked something by accident, but this should be uh, E2, F2. Now, let's see, it should work. Why is it defaulting to the row? Sorry, folks, Excel's being a little strange at the moment. Let's undo, let's go back. All right, I'm wondering if it's because I used the function for this column rather than just type it in manually. What happens if I grab the empty cell? Okay, so in this case, usually this doesn't happen, I apologize. I think because instead of entering the formula manually for this, so um, typically how I do this is I would just do equals E2 plus F2 rather than use the sum function. Because I didn't do that, I think it's confusing Excel as to what it is I want to uh, where does I want to place that formula, essentially? So what I did was I included the empty cell at the end, G14, which kind of told Excel that it, it was basically a way of um, telling Excel what it is I wanted to add exactly and where to put that formula. So if you're having the same problem, when you select, make sure you're also selecting G14, the empty cell and then click auto sum, and there's our answer, $1,754.21. Now, I'm gonna double click on that cell real quick to show you the function, there it is. The function and the formula, G2 through G13. Now, in this case, we definitely wanted to use a function. Why? Because if I didn't, I would have had to spell it out as equals G2 plus G3 plus G4 plus G5, et cetera way too time consuming. When we use a function, all we have to do is establish the cell range, which is the first cell and the last cell in the range you select. And we'll take care of everything in between. And again, if you're inside the cell like this, just press enter, I wouldn't click because you don't want to add something to that formula by accident. I'm gonna do a quick save. All right, so now all the math is done. Let's go ahead and format this data set. Let's dress it up a little bit, make, a little, make it a little more presentable. All right, especially if we want to print All right, so first of all, we have a lot of currency values in here. I wanna convert these to US dollars, meaning that they're gonna have no more than two decimal places. They're going to have dollar symbols as well. All right, we don't need to do all that. We don't need to type that stuff in or change anything. Excel allows us to format data values to specific kinds of numbers, date and time, currency, percentages, etc. So, all I really have to do is select the values that I want to format and then select the formatting I need from the ribbon above. So I'm gonna to go to cell D2. Remember, we're not using the fill handle, just the regular select cursor. I'll select D2 through uh, G13 and I'll grab G14 in a second. I'll do that one separately. Okay, there it is. Now, in the in the home tab, you have your number group. That's where we go to format for different kinds of numbers. You can, if you want to explore the the options in the ribbon itself, that's fine. I tend to just use the dialog box. I think it's a little bit easier. So I'm gonna click on this arrow here to launch the dialog box like this. You'll see under number and then under category, there is a category called currency. I'm gonna select it. Look to the right, it will default to US dollars. So we have a dollar symbol and we have two decimal places. 
If you wanted to, if you wanted to do a different currency, of course you could. Excel supports many of them, perhaps all of them. I'm not sure. But we're just going to leave it U.S. dollars, two decimal places. Click OK. All right, and if you want to just try that again, click on cell G14. Oops, there we go. I'll go up to the number group, click on the dialog box launcher, select currency from the categories, click OK. And as you can see, it also gives you commas if you're in the thousands or up. I'm going to do a quick save. All right, now the next thing I want to do is give this a title. We did this in Excel 1. I want to put a title above this data set. All right, I want to put it above the data set. The problem is a similar problem we had earlier in class. I don't have a, a top row available. So once again, I need to insert a new row. No big deal. So remember, new rows go above the row that is currently selected. So I'm going to select any one cell from row 1. I'll go up to the Home tab, over to the Cells group. I'll go to the Insert dropdown and select Insert Sheet Rows. And there we go. And this is important. By doing that, it also um, it changed all the cell references, right? All the cell names. For example, before this was C. 2 times D2, now it's C3 times D3. So I just want to remind you that if you enter formulas and then you start adding columns and rows, that's okay. Excel will just update the cell references accordingly. You don't have to worry about corrupting your data. Now we're in, uh, so we have a new row one. Let's go ahead and put in our title. Now we want the title to be centered above the data. That's going to be impossible though because we have a bunch of individual cells with divisions in between. So how can we possibly center something above the whole data set? Well, remember Excel allows us to merge cells together to form one big cell with no divisions in between. And it will at the same time center our alignment. So it's centered. So this tool that I'm talking about is called Merge and Center, which is in your alignment group in the Home tab. So before we click on it, we need to select the cells that we want to merge. So I'll use my select cursor and select A1 through G1. Now I'll go up to the, to the alignment group and click on Merge and Center. There it is. They're all merged as, into one big cell. And if I double click into that cell, the alignment is already centered. So now I can just type in my title, which will be, um, Broadway musical soundtracks. Now I'm going to exit that cell for a second. I'll do a quick save. Now let's dress up our title a little bit. So now we're just going to kind of add some, uh, you know, a little bit of artistic flair to this. Okay, some cosmetic changes. So I want to increase the font size of my title a little bit. So I'm going to go back and click on that cell again where the title is. Remember, in Excel, you don't necessarily have to select the actual contents, kind of like we do in Word. Okay. If you're going to change all of the contents to the same formatting command, same font size, same font, whatever it is, you could just select the cell itself. And then that formatting command will apply to all the contents inside of it universally. So I've selected that cell where the title is. I'll go up to the Home tab to the Font group, which contains many of the same tools we find in Microsoft Word. I'll go to where the 11 is. That's my font size. I'll click on the drop down and change it to 14. Another thing I like to do is fill in that cell with a color. 
So also in the font group, you have your uh, fill color tool, which is the paint bucket. If you click on the drop down, you'll get a palette of colors. Remember, you could always go to more colors at the bottom to get to more colors that are, than that what are available here. But I'll just use one of the ones from this palette. And one last thing, there is a font called Broadway. So I'm just going to use that. So I'm going back up to the font group one more time. Where it says Calibri, I'm going to click on that drop down to select a different font. This is called Broadway, so I'll, sl I'll scroll down to the Bs, select Broadway from the list, and there it is. I'll do a quick save. All right, now, let's talk about comments. Excel allows you to attach comments to specific cells, whether it's for somebody to, whether you're, you might be leaving instructions for somebody, referring to a specific value. It might be there for further review. You might, you might need to clarify a data value. There might be some kind of anomaly that you need to add some clarification. Okay, this number is this because of X, Y, Z. Okay, uh, you know, maybe the store closed for a week because of like a weather related closure. So that's why we didn't sell so many, something like that. So you can leave comments and attach them to cells for, again, further review or clarification. So I'm looking at cell C5 where there's a zero. All right, we, let's say we pass this off to our supervisor. They're a little concerned we didn't sell any of this title. Okay. Um, during that promotional month. So they wanna leave a comment there. They wanna tell us to discount the price next year. Maybe that will help sell. It is, if you look, it's actually the most expensive one in the set here. So maybe that's why it didn't sell. So I'm gonna select cell C5 and add a comment. Now comments are typically um, we typically do this in a review stage. After we've entered all of our data and everything's done, we then review it again for many any errors or, like I said, uh, anomalies, things that need some further clarification. So since we do that in a review stage, we have to go to the review tab in the ribbon. And underneath, we have the comments group. Let me just turn that off. Good. And you'll see new comment. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And now we get a comment box that points to that cell. The name in that box will be your Windows account name. Okay. And we're going to just type in, notice the blinking insertion point. We could just start typing. I'll type in discount price. Next year. Now, if you click outside of that cell, as a default, the comment will hide. That's okay because there's still that red triangle in the cell, which lets you know there's a comment there. And if you point at the cell, you don't even have to click on it. The comment will pop up. All right, but if you want your comments to show at all times, whether on the screen or because you want them to be printed, you have to make sure that they are in fact turned on for showing. So in other words, if you want to, if you want to make sure that your comments print out on hard copy, they must be showing. You can't leave it in this auto hide mode. So up there in the comments group, you'll see show hide comment. You'll also see show all comments. All right. If you had, let's say 10 comments, show all comments will just show all of them at once. So they're always showing rather than having to go through each one individually. So in this case, it doesn't really matter which one you click because we only have one. So click on show all comments. And now no matter where you click on the worksheet, the comment stays there. And again, you have to do this if you want to print them out. 
if you want to print them out on the worksheet itself. Okay. Now you can also um, you can move these boxes around. You can also resize them. Notice the little squares around it. All right. If you point at the bottom center, that's called a sizing handle. You'll get a two-way arrow. Click and drag up to just close up that extra space. And then if you point between those little squares on the outline, you'll get a four-way arrow. If you click and drag with that, you can move it to a new location. So you're not blocking the data behind it. So I'll just kind of move it down here under Wicked. But you still get an arrow pointing to that cell. All right, let me do a quick save. And if you're using Microsoft 365, um, I don't want to get into too much detail because I don't want to confuse you. 365 has two different things. One's called notes, one is called comments. Okay, in that scenario, notes act like comments here in Excel 2019. And then comments in the 365 subscription are different. They're meant for collaboration. So just, again, without going into too much detail, if you are using 365, keep in mind, notes are what comments are in Excel 2019 here and other Excel versions. All right, it's a change they made to basically keep up with Google. So just keep that in mind. All right. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about, and then we're going to get this set up for printing. Freezing panes. This is very simple. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, I'm going to zoom in very closely to really give you the full effect. A problem we often have when we're looking at a worksheet on a screen in Excel. If we, especially if we have a lot of data, okay, a lot of rows, a lot of a uh, lot of columns. As I scroll down and I look at this figure here, 1199, I don't know what category, for lack of a better term, all right, what category that belongs to. What's the label? I have to constantly scroll up and down to see what it is. It's cost per CD. Okay. Likewise, if I scroll to the right, I don't know what title that's associated with. I have to constantly scroll to the left to see what title it belongs to which can be very annoying. So Excel allows us to freeze rows and columns so they're always in our view. Okay, we call that freezing panes, P-A-N-E, like a window pane. All right, keep in mind what we're talking about here is no effect on the printed copy, only the way we view it on the screen. So let's talk about where to find this tool first. Since it is a view, uh, since it's affecting our view, it's going to be in the View tab. And then we have the Window group here. And this tool is right here called Freeze Panes. All right. I'm going to click on that and just review the options there. And then we'll actually go ahead and um, implement this tool. But let's talk about the options first. We see Freeze Panes. Freeze top row, freeze first column. Freeze top row and freeze first column. These two options are there, assuming that the labels you need are in row one and or column A, top row, first column. In our case, however, the labels we need are in row two and column B. So we cannot use either of those options. We need to go with option one, freeze panes, and if you look at what it says, it says based on current selection, which means that we need to target it in our worksheet so that Excel knows what to freeze. It's the same exact technique we use with inserting rows and columns. We need to target it by selecting a specific cell. Okay, so let's go back to our worksheet. And again, it's the same rules. If I need to freeze column B, I'm going to select any cell from column C, because if I select the cell from column C, it's going to freeze the column to the left, 
Remember I told you columns are always left, rows are always above. So if I need to freeze row two, I'm gonna select any cell from row three because that will then freeze whatever, it will freeze the row above it, in that case, row two. So if I select cell C3, it will do both things. It's going to target column B to the left and target row two above. So now that, now that I've selected that cell, I'll go back to freeze panes and click on the first option, freeze panes. Now, if I scroll down, you'll see that rows one and two stay there. And if I scroll to the right, columns A and B stay there. Okay. And like I said, this has no effect on the printed copy. If I print it out like this, I'll still get the whole worksheet. Now, if you want to unfreeze panes, all you have to do is go back up, click on freeze panes, and you'll see that now it says unfreeze panes, click on it, and you're back to normal. Very simple. All right, I'm doing a quick save here. I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit. All right, now let's talk about printing. I'm gonna to go to file then to print. So I'm in the print preview screen. In Excel when we talked about, um, we address the sort of, uh, we address the kind of uh, problems we had with the way this would print right now. If we just click print, this is how it would look, which is not the best, okay? So let's walk through the things we did in Excel one and we're gonna add a couple things along the way. All right, but just to kind of recap, we're gonna change this to uh, landscape orientation so it prints out horizontally across the page, which tends to work better for Excel. We're also going to increase the scaling so we can kind of zoom in on it and make it a little bigger so we can read it better. We're going to center our data set on the page rather than have it top, uh, top left, it's gonna be dead center. We're going to add a header and footer and we're going to add the grid lines back, which I like, and also our comments. So all those things I just discussed, they, they're all done in the page setup dialog box. How do we get to that page setup dialog box? Two ways. From this print preview screen, if you scroll down these settings, you'll see this blue link here where I'm circling called page setup. Otherwise, from the main work screen, you can go to the page layout tab and you'll see the page setup group here and click on the dialog box launcher. You'll get the same exact dialog box either way. So here it is, page setup. We're gonna go through each of those tabs at the top left to right, page, margins, header, footer, sheet. In the page tab, we're gonna change it from portrait to landscape orientation. So click on the bubble for landscape. Underneath, we have scaling. Okay, this is how you can essentially zoom in on the worksheet and print it out in that zoomed in perspective. You could also zoom out if you're trying to fit everything onto one side of one page. All right, so we have a little room to play with. So we're gonna increase it from 100% to 125. So either click into the box and type in 125 or use the up arrow to just increase it to 125. And as I said in Excel one, when you adjust scaling, it typically takes a bit of trial and error. You change the number, you go to print preview down here, see how it looks. It might be too big, where it's on two pages now. It might be too small. So you have to kind of play with the number until it's just right. I've done this before, so I happen to know that 125 works. So that's what we're going with. Now we're moving over to the margins tab. Here we're gonna center it on the page horizontally and vertically. So go down to the bottom where it says center on page and check off both boxes, horizontally, vertically. Now we're gonna go up to the header footer tab. If you took word two with me this morning, you might remember I talked about how we use headers and footers. They're used for identifying information like the author, the date that this was created and page numbers. So we're gonna go to custom header first. And by the way, headers go into your top margin, footers go into your bottom margin. 
of the page, okay? So we're in the header right now. We have a left section, a center section, and a right section. In the left section, I'm gonna put in my first and last name. I'm gonna click into the center section. If you wanna call it Excel 2 practice, that's fine. I'm just gonna put in, once again, uh, Broadway musical soundtracks. Then we're gonna click into the right section. We're gonna put a date here, but remember whenever we use Office, we don't type in the date ourselves, we let Office do it for us. So in this little toolbar here, right above these three sections, you will see an insert date icon. It looks like a little calendar. Click on it. It will not look like a date, but it will when we go to the preview. So click OK. And if you look at the preview here, that's how the header is going to look. Now let's do a footer. All we want to do in the footer is add a page number. So go to custom footer. Decide where you want your page number, left, center, or right. I like to put it in the center. So I'll click into the center section. Once again, whenever we insert a page number, we don't do it ourselves. We let Office do it for us. So in the same toolbar above, there's an insert page number icon. It's the second one from the left. It says insert page number, click on it, click OK, and you'll see in the preview that we have a page one. Now last but not least, we're gonna go to the sheet tab. In the print area down here, oops. All right, a couple things. We're gonna add grid lines and comments. So that first grid lines box, check it off by clicking into it. Next door, we have comments to the, over to the right. Click on the drop down. You'll see, aside from none, you'll see two options, at end of sheet as displayed on sheet. At end of sheet, this will put them onto a separate page and it will, actu it will actually add footnotes. So the worksheet will have little footnotes next to the, to the respective cells and then the actual comments will be on a separate sheet of paper. We just want to print out that comment box exactly as it was shown. So we're going to select as displayed on sheet. Now in a second, I just want to review this here, repeat uh, rows and columns, but first let's just see how this looks in the print preview. So I'm just, um, instead of clicking print preview here, I'm going to click OK, save it, and then go to print preview. So I'm going to click OK, do a quick save, and then go to file print. And here's how it looks now. Okay, so we have landscape orientation. The long edges of the page are on the top and bottom rather than on the left and right. We've increased the scaling so it's a bit bigger. We could see we could read it better. The data set is centered horizontally and vertically on the page. We've added a header and footer. And last but not least, we added the grid lines back so you can see the lines between each cell and we have our comment. All right, now, I just wanna review that one tool real quick. Um, Cause this is something that people often have trouble with or at least they don't know this tool exists. So I'm gonna go back to that page setup dialog box to the sheet tab where we have these two tools here, rows to repeat at top, columns to repeat at left. A problem people often have when they print from Excel, even if they change the scaling, okay, if you make it, um, if you're trying to fit everything onto one page, which is what we often wanna do, we could do that by decreasing the scaling, but it's gonna be so small that you can hardly read it. So, you can let Excel print it onto multiple pages. The problem with that is, kind of like we saw with freezing panes before, it's gonna leave off certain rows and columns that we need to identify other cells because they might be on page one and everything on page two doesn't have a label. So we have to constantly look at page one to make sense of it. So similarly, we can select a row to repeat on every page that comes out of the printer. We can select a column to repeat that comes out of every page on the printer. You could do multiple rows and multiple columns, not just one. So if you go to a row to repeat at top, and you click on the little arrow here, 
Same thing for columns. All right, what that does is it will collapse this dialog box. You can go down to your sheet, select a row, let's say row two. Notice how it selects the entire row. I go back up to that dialog box, click on the little arrow again to the right, which will ex expand it. And it says rows to repeat at top, row two. It has those little dollar symbols. That's just part of the Excel syntax. Don't worry about it. What it's doing is it's going to repeat row two onto every sheet of paper that comes out of the printer. That way you don't have to always refer to, let's say, page one to get those uh, column labels from row two. And you do the same thing for columns. Click on the arrow, select the column from the sheet, click on the arrow again to open up this dialog box, and you'll see it there. And then you would click OK, save it, and then when you print, everything will just be, like I said, you'll see it um, on the printed copy. All right. So if you have any further questions about what we covered today, go ahead and submit them to the GoToMeeting chat. Click on the chat bubble, type in your question, hit send. I'm going to go through a few closing remarks, and then we're all set for the day here. But as you saw, we have a nice, a great looking uh, worksheet ready to come out of our printer. If you want to go ahead and print yours, of course, you can do that. Just click on the big print button. You're all set. <clears throat> Oops. There we go. All right, so thank you for coming to Excel 2 today. Next week in Excel 3, we're going to shift gears a bit, okay? So um, Excel 3 next Thursday, February 17th at 2. We're going to start talking about how we get more information from our data rather than just like the data set itself, okay? So in Excel 3, I'm going to show you how to work across multiple sheets at the same time, which really expedites things for you. We're also going to, we're going to talk about consolidating data into one sheet, okay? And then we're going to take that consolidated data and turn it into charts and graphs. So Excel 3 is loaded, okay? So come, come prepared. And like I said, we won't be doing a whole lot of review. I do like to kind of jump in once we get to level 3. Remember that this class was recorded. It will be available on our library's YouTube channel. To get to that YouTube channel, visit our website at mcl.org. Click on the YouTube icon at the top left of the homepage. That will then take you to our YouTube channel. And once you're there, select playlists and then select the computer instruction playlist. And remember, we have a lot of great, um, a lot of other great recordings from other library programs available in other playlists, so check them all out. All right, we also have our handouts, as I mentioned at the beginning of class. If you need to get the handout for this class or a different class, they're available on our website. So go to mcl.org, click on services from the main menu, and then select technology instruction. Once you're on the technology instruction page, just scroll down and you will see all the handouts listed by the name of the class. While you're on the technology instruction page, remember that from there, you can also register for more classes. All right, you can do this on the main events page on our library website. You can also do it from our technology instruction page. Just find one of the register buttons. There's one for in-person, there's one for online. It doesn't matter which one you click. They both take you to the same computer class calendar. And then once you're on that calendar, you can scroll through and register for whatever classes interest you. All right, and remember, you can repeat, you can retake classes. So if you want to take Excel 2 again next month, by all means, register again. All right, and last but not least, in that computer class calendar, you might notice something called private sessions. All right, we offer virtual private sessions on select Fridays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. In these virtual private sessions, we work with just you individually on a computer project you might need some help with, an Excel worksheet, a Word document, something like that. Or maybe you have a tech device you need some troubleshooting tips for. Sometimes we can help with that as well. All right, so if you want to sign up for one of these, again, they are virtual only. And you'll see them in the same computer class calendar. Just follow the link and follow the instructions to book your appointment. 
All right, and by the way, um, we should have some in-person options available starting next Monday for classes and other library programs. All right, I would just encourage you to check our website first to make sure that we're back to in-person. It would tell you right on our homepage. All right, if you have any other questions about our technology instruction program, you can always send us an email to techclass at mcl.org. If you have no further questions about today's class and you're all set, you can click on the X in the upper right hand corner of the GoToMeeting window and then select Leave Meeting. If you are leaving us, thanks so much for coming today and we hope to see you again in class very soon. Take care.